Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. I trust you had a great long and extended weekend. We've had rain, but it was such fun to have a few days to potter around and do your own thing. Macro thoughts, my goodness, what a day yesterday turned out to be. But let's first of all look at quarter one. It was a torrid time for markets. And Jamie at Reuters is saying expect more of the same in quarter two. The fear index VIX jumped to 36% above the 2018 average as latest ISM manufacturing data threatens the Goldilocks narrative. Prices pay uh, went considerably higher. Shows slower growth but higher prices paid. China unveiled retaliatory duties on US food imports including pork, fruit, nuts and wine of up to 25% quite a granular response. The S&P 500 closed below its average price for the past 200 days for the first time since June 2016. A lot of people look at that 200 day moving average. Um, uh, with fresh presidential criticism of Amazon.com and retaliatory tariffs from China rattling investors. The CBOE volatility index jumped 18%. LMT978, who I follow on Twitter, says, I would have expected VIX to be higher. This sell-off has been more of a grind than a panic so far, he says. Three-month dollar LIBOR has now risen for 37 straight days, the longest consecutive streak of rises since 2005. And it's surprising that that has not really fed through into the dollar yet. Home thoughts, there is no longer anything I can fear. There is nothing the government has not done to me. There isn't any pain I haven't known. Winnie Mandela, who passed away at the age of 81. Very interesting, powerful, charismatic personality. Quite twin-sided, however. To those who oppose us, we say, strike the woman strike the rock 1966 Winnie Mandela um, and I'll come back to that I love driving around the national park and game parks in general you never know what's going to be around the corner I thoroughly enjoyed myself down over the weekend and drove through the national park down to the RP plains you never know what you're going to see around the corner and particularly I like being on my own quite muddy down there, I got scared I was going to get stuck. Um, this is a photograph of landscapes uh, as seen from Arimi National Park 1, you looking down towards the Arthi Plains from above, and the other one uh, you're looking at two rhinos in the foreground and the city in the background. The park covers an area of 117.21 square kilometres and is small in comparison to most of Africa's national parks. Park's altitude ranges between 1,533 and 1,760 meters. It has a dry climate. The park is the only protected park, part of the Arthi Kapiti ecosystem, which according to all the old books I've read as well, there were huge concentrations of game. Making up less than 10% of this ecosystem, the park has a diverse range of habitats and species. Located about 7 kilometers from Nairobi Center, I left very early in the morning, but it always takes a bit of time getting processed through. In this photograph, you see rhinos. Uh, uh, I came across five rhinos uh, right near the RP plains. Uh, took this photograph and then this short video as well. I was there by myself, I got quite close and then got a bit nervous. Uh, this is a photograph of zebras that I found again. Uh, they were very bold and stayed very close to me. I really thoroughly enjoyed myself. Trekking the Kilimanjaro Mountain, Africa's highest peak. I like this photograph by Alex Eakins. 
and this one from Discover Africa, Boa Vista, Cape Verde, Travel Africa. Political reflections on land day, thousands are marching to the Israeli fence bordering Gaza. Lots of Palestinians were shot dead, some actually walking away from that fence. There were clashes between Palestinian protesters and Israeli bullets, Karl R. E. Marx tweeted. Winnie Mandela, this brilliant Jay Layton photograph is my favorite. Mama Winnie, or mother of the nation, the woman who spent 27 years campaigning for the release of her imprisoned husband, Nelson Mandela, died aged 81 yesterday. Winnie Madikizela Mandela, as she was latterly known, in her own words, she deserved so much more than gave her read this um, so as I said a mercurial powerful personality um, you know who's to know what she went through in that struggle uh, against apartheid but um, you know she had a reputation for uh, violence you remember the story about Stompy um, but obviously a really totemic figure the leaders of North and South Korea have set a meeting on April 27th. That's a report on TikTok. But first, K-pop group Red Velvet will perform hits like Bad Boy in Pyongyang this Sunday. And uh, Kim Jong-un uh, went to uh, listen to that. But have a look at this. This is Korean Central TV documentary of Kim Jong-un's visit to China amazing. The Chinese received him with full pomp and ceremony, I thought. Um, uh, it, it's very interesting to watch the body language. Obviously, his wife is a very strong asset as well. As I said on the 18th of September uh, last year, it is entirely unlikely that the West has anything to offer the Chinese that can compensate them for the loss of their hinterland, their buffer. And their instrument of attack. 12th of February this year, I wrote, China was never interested in bringing him to heel. After all, he is the buffer state between China and more than 30,000 US soldiers parked on their doorstep in South Korea. And September 2017, I wrote about a screaming coming across the sky. And the important point is he has a deterrent. He's proven that. I was going back to Gravity's Rainbow in 1973, which is all about the design, production, and dispatch of V-2 rockets by the German military. In particular, it features the quest undertaken by several characters to uncover the secret of a mysterious device named the schwarz Gerät, the black device, slated to be installed in a rocket with the serial number 00000. As the world watches Pyongyang, I cannot help wondering if Kim Jong-un has read Thomas Pynchon, who speaks of a screaming coming across the sky. It is a curve each of them feels, unmistakably it is the parabola. They must have guessed, once or twice guessed, and refused to believe that everything always collectively had been moving toward that purified shape latent in the sky. That shape of no surprise, no second chance, no return. And then, way back in 2010, I wrote a piece, Far away in distant lands lies the hermit kingdom. They have all had tiny little hands like the elves and the elves and the shoemaker. Very interesting piece in the New Yorker, a Saudi prince's quest to remake the Middle East. In his work with the White House, is Mohammed bin Salman driving out extremism or merely seizing power for himself. A few days after Trump was inaugurated, Kushner sat down to decide how to reshape the Middle East. During the campaign, Trump had promised a sweeping transformation of the region. Steve Bannon, Trump's senior aide and ideologist at the time, told me recently, our plan was to annihilate the physical caliphate of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, not attrition, annihilation, and to roll back the Persians and force the Gulf states to stop funding radical Islam. 
the Middle East Initiative, Bannon said, was one of the few points of agreement in an otherwise fractious White House. Jared and I were at war on a number of other topics, but not this. Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, was put in charge of policy for the region. He had no experience in diplomacy in Middle Eastern politics at 36. He had spent his working life managing New York and New Jersey real estate projects. He's not a scholar on this stuff, the official said. His knowledge is gained from talking to movers and shakers in that part of the world. You can read a lot of books but never get the type of education you get from talking to the Kissingers and the Petraeuses of the world. Kushner met with aides from the National Security Council who took out the map and assessed the situation. Surveying the region, they concluded that the northern tier of the Middle East had been lost to Iran in Lebanon, Hezbollah and Iranian proxy control the government. In Syria, Iran had helped President Bashar, uh, had helped save President Bashar from military disaster and was now bolstering his political future. In Iraq, the government, nominally pro-American, was also under the sway of Tehran. We, can't, we kind of set those to the side, the official told me. We thought, so then what? Our anchors were Israel and Saudi Arabia. We can't be successful in the Gulf without Saudi Arabia. As Kushner grappled with the complexities of Middle East politics, he and MBS began a conversation by telephone and email. They've become close very fast. They see the world in the same way. They see themselves as being in the tech-savvy money world. Kushner followed up with a visit to Riyadh, the first of three such trips. The two men stayed up nearly till dawn, discussing the future of their countries. Um, once during a meeting at the home of Secretary of State John Kerry, MBS spotted a grand piano, walked over and began playing the Moonlight Sonata. His favorite diversion is Call of Duty, the video game. His English is halting, and among his brothers he has nine, he's unusually bound to Saudi Arabia. The guy's not soft. He has a lot of charisma. He's a lot like Bill Clinton. He makes you feel like you're super important when you're talking to him. He really puts on a charm that is unmistakable. As MBS grew into adulthood, he brazenly used his status to enrich himself in his teens, according to people who know him. He visited a series of wealthy businessmen and asked them to put money into his personal investment fund. In a matter of weeks, he raised $30 million. He's the son of Salman, MBS, his friend told me. It's not like anyone was going to say no. According to a story that circulates in Riyadh, MBS demanded that a Saudi land registry official help him appropriate a property. After the official refused, he received an envelope with a single bullet inside. The episode earned MBS the street name Abu Rasasa, or father of the bullet. The story is true, the friend said. I think that MBS realizes that he went too far towards some people in those days and he's trying to make amends. At the gathering of prominent venture capitalists at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco, MBS spoke bluntly about Saudi Arabia's prospects. According to one attendee, he said in 20 years, oil goes to zero and then renewables take over. I have 20 years to reorient my country and launch it into the future. The attendee said, my jaw was on the floor. The meeting had the dynamic of a tech startup. He's throwing the harpoon talking about Obama paying his final visit to Saudi Arabia. And uh, Obama's advisors noticed that each time the president spoke, Salman, who was 80, paused before answering, while MBS is several seats to his left, typed on an iPad. When MBS finished, the king read from an iPad of his own and then responded to Obama. The chances of that being a coincidence are quite low. As MBS gained power, he was aided by an ally from outside the kingdom, Mohammed bin Zayed, MBZ. And then talking about Qatar, they made it clear privately and publicly that their intention was to replace the Emir. Um, population barely 300,000 controls one of the world's largest natural gas fields and has a sovereign wealth fund worth an estimated $300 billion. If you look at it from a financial perspective, Invading Qatar makes a lot of sense. 
While MBS was pre preaching austerity to his countrymen, he seemed unwilling to restrain himself. In 2015, while vacationing in the south of France, he bought a yacht, the Serene, from a Russian vodka tycoon for $550 million. He bought a chateau west of Paris with a cinema and a moat with a submerged glass chamber for viewing car. And last November, he reportedly spent $440 million on Salvatore Mundi, the Leonardo da Vinci portrait of Jesus Christ. Very interesting. As I said in November 2017, this is an unprecedented moment in the history of the kingdom and the most parable, perilous moment for the House of Saud that I can recall. Um, I've written a, a piece uh, 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 where I said that one of the biggest challenges Africa faces on the world stage is consolidating its 55 voices into one. Bitcoin fell below 7,000 before rebounding. It's now at 7,350. But it's down about 50% year to date. Currency markets, euro dollar 123.09, dollar index 90.02, Japanese yen. 105.95 Swiss franc point 95.52 the pound 140.59 the Australian dollar 0.7691 India rupee 65.13 South Korean won 1058.79 Brazilian real 3382 Egyptian pound 17.6190 and the South African rand 1182.59 of course we had the rate card which is under the rand. According to uh, Chi Girl, who I follow on Twitter, 91 is the key level in the dollar index. She's looking for a break above 91, 293. She says a break below 88 would negate the long side, which is what I've been saying as well, and where I have my stop. Euro versus the dollar, let's take a look at where that is, 123.08. Last, kind of no man's land, to be honest. Tesla bonds keep falling. Take a look at this from Lisa Abramovitz. Um, and then Elon Musk, rather insensitively, I thought, poor decision, tweeted, Tesla goes bankrupt, Palo Alto, California, April 1, 2018. April Fool's joke, obviously, despite intense efforts to raise money, including a last-ditch mass sale of Easter eggs, we are sad to report that Tesla's gone completely and totally bankrupt. Then he tweeted a photograph of himself. Elon was found passed out against a Tesla Model 3, surrounded by Tesla Keeler bottles, the tracks of dried tears still visible on his cheeks. This is not a forward-looking statement because obviously what's the point? Happy New Month. And I agree with OMT978 who said it was he was surprised to see Elon's April Fool's bankruptcy tweet. Uh, with as bad as Tesla unwind was last week. Gold, let's take a look. 1338.50, that's had a good rebound yesterday. Crude oil, $63.11 after a very steep fall yesterday. Haiti voodoo ceremonies and souvenirs held during Easter weekend. Have a look at this photograph. First time ever seeing what appears to be Ethiopia's equivalent of the Oval Office. This is the appointment of the new Prime Minister. Um, uh, I hope this moment of gesture marks the beginning of a new era of transparency and open government. Lots of positive momentum. He's tapped into it. Listen to what he said. This is a historic moment, said Abby. This is high time for us to learn from our past mistakes and make up for all the wrongs done in the past. We understand there are lots of problems that need to be solved with great urgency. Abby apologized for the deaths of civilians in the violent protests. He said his administration will strive to solve grievances by discussion rather than by force, provide more space for opposition parties, fight corruption and focus on the respect for the rule of law. He said he aims to open up a fresh dialogue with Eritrea and he called upon Ethiopia's diaspora to more actively take part in the country's affairs. Today is a historic day. We bear witness to a peaceful transfer of power. Today our situation presents us with opportunities and threats. Today we're in the midst of uncertain times, he said. It is time. Let's build a wall of love between Ethiopia and Eritrea. 
Um, so he's really saying the right things, in my view. The question is, can he deliver? Will the deep state allow him the freedom of maneuver? Yields on African euro bonds have continued to decline, according to Cyton. I wrote a piece in TRT World as free trade, a silver bullet for African prosperity. Take a look. I started by saying Africa is not a country, goes the popular mean. In fact, there are 55 states on the continent. Negotiating a common pan-African position on free trade is a massive undertaking and informs us why Africa lacks leverage on the global stage. Angolan foreign currency reserves dropped to an eight-year low. DR Congo's main opposition party chose the son of its founder as the leader and presidential candidate. We can all remember that moment when Nelson Mandela came out of prison blinking in the sunlight and assumed leadership. SABC News kindly tweeted me a little bit of that footage. Do take a look at it. It's about 30 seconds long. South African oil shares down 6.77% year to date. Dollar versus Rand 1182.70. Still, Mr. 97%. Egypt LCC defeats token opponent. It was a pleasure to meet His Excellency the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Mohamedou Buhari, at the launch of Eco Atlantic, said Naomi Campbell. Nigerian all shares up 8.53% year to date. The Ghana Stock Exchange, which is the world's best, is up 30.51% year to date. Margo Kaiser tweeted plane carrying US Special Forces gets stuck on a sandy airstrip in a remote area in Kenya near the Somalia border. The US registered aircraft belonged to Eric Prince, founder of Blackwater, Trump's unofficial war advisor. Note the men in the bushes. Elephant Info has a very interesting article which says the handshake was a zero-sum game. I called it the rapprochement. In that article, they're saying there were clear winners and losers, and it does not take much guesswork to know who won and who lost. I like this from the central bank governor. Logbook tables opened a door to a non-linear, multi-dimensional world, from a flat earth to an exploding universe with vivid colors. Respect to my teachers. Housing finance reported full year results. Earnings per share slumped 86.1%. Loans and advances to customers declined 8.867%. There's a bit of uh, complexity in those results. Take a look at it if you're interested. Uh, profit uh, before tax was down 75.191%. Earnings per share slumped 86.1%. They reduced the dividend payout by 30%. The board has recommended the issuance of a bonus share for every 10 held. I think they were caught at the bleeding edge of the rate cap. Stanley Fahari Iwit reported full year earnings. Um, take a look at that as well. Um, earnings per share, headline earnings per unit was 78 cents versus 89 cents, so down 12.36%. Basic earnings per share was up 61.017%. Um, Property expense ratio remained flat at 34%. Um, and plenty of detail in those results. Do take a look at that. Home Africa CEO expects to wrap up talks with investors by July. The share price is down 21.428% year to date. Um, the company said a due diligence exercise by the private equity company and another private investor were delayed by as much as four months due to a protracted election last year. They've been trying to raise cash since last year to complete projects in Nairobi. Kuwitu Ventures also reported full year earnings per share. Um, what happened there? They've, they've reported a loss per share of 106 versus 142 last time round, but I can't make head or tail of those earnings, I must admit. Nairobi all shares up 11.7% year to date and just half a percent of the record high. The NSE 20 is up 3.59% year to date. Once again, thank you for stopping by.